Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome to our session, Pathways into the Healthcare's Healthcare Sector. Uh, thank you for joining us. I will uh, give a bit of time because you can see we've got 20 uh, people who have joined us and that will continue to grow. Um, if you are here to, to find out more about the healthcare sector and, and a pathway in, then this is the right session. Uh, my name is Jack. Uh, I am uh, from Middlesex University hosting uh, this careers fair. Um, and I will kind of introduce the, the fantastic panelists we've got here uh, in a second. The purpose of this careers panel is to kind of give you some insight into the breadth of different careers, and in this case, courses that there are to access the, the healthcare sector. Um, we've got a, a varied uh, group of panelists here, uh, uh, spanning a, a number of different potential NHS careers, um, and hopefully they'll give you some insight into that, that pathway. Um, if you wish to ask our panellists any questions, uh, please use the Q&A function um, and uh, we will be able to see them and share them with our, our panellists. You're welcome to direct at someone or open it up to, to anyone if, if that's easier. Um, just as a note, if there is anyone particularly interested in pharmacy uh, at this, uh, uh, then you're welcome to attend that session. It's currently running at the same time. So if, that, if pharmacy is your, something you're particularly interested in, you're welcome to do that and then come back and watch the recording of this session. You will receive all of the recordings, um, no matter which session you attend. Um, so let me introduce our fantastic panel. Uh, I'm going to ask them to actually introduce themselves. Um, and Nikki, if I could hand over to you to, to kick off. Hello, everybody. Really good to see you. Thank you very much for coming and spending time with us this evening and thinking about having a career in kind of health and social care. It's, it's such an important, exciting and vibrant area. So we're really pleased to see you. Uh, my name is Nikki Lambert. I'm a mental health nurse. I've been a mental health nurse for 20 years and I'm now in learning and teaching while I'm an associate professor. So the sorts of things that I do every day, um, I work with service users, with people with mental health issues. Uh, I teach, I do research. Uh, all kinds of different things. I work a lot with the public and I think that for me, being a mental health nurse particularly, um, was something that I wanted to do when I found other mental health nurses. I originally went off to be an English and history teacher, if you can imagine the horror of that. Um, I met um, mental health um, colleagues when I was traveling around Australia on a break and they were saying, oh, you're a mental health nurse. And I was like, I don't know what that is. And they're like, no, you are, you, you, aren't you? And then I looked into it and I realized absolutely I'm a mental health nurse through and through. I love it. It's been uh, the great joy of my life, I think, this job. And I, I want whatever you want for, for you to have the same passion about the kind of work that you end up in because you spend a long time working. You know, your job does define you a little bit. It, it makes a big difference to the kind of life that you live and the kind of um, impact you have on other people around you. And to be happy in your work is really the most important thing, I think. So I absolutely wish you, whatever choices you make, to have as much fun as I have and um, to love it as much as I do. So that's me. I hand back to Jack. Thank you, Nikki. That was great. I really appreciate that. Uh, over to you, Sarah. Thank you. Um, yeah, I agree with Nikki. It's so great to see so many of you here. Um, and that you're interested in entering a healthcare profession. Um, it's absolutely brilliant. Um, and we are all one team um, as such. Um, we all work together. And that's what's so brilliant about healthcare is that we all want to work for the same purpose. Um, so my name is Sarah Bennett. I am the deputy lead for the medical degree programme at UCL Medical School in central London, uh, which is behind me in some sunshine. Um, I'm also the admissions tutor for the medicine degree programme there as well. So I have the joy of selecting the next generation of doctors, uh, which is absolutely brilliant and the best part of my job. Um, I am a doctor by background and I, in fact, trained at UCL. So I am a bit like a stick of rock with UCL right down the middle. Um, I did go away for a few years and practice as a doctor before coming back to now work at UCL as a teacher there. I too am an associate professor there. Um, and I absolutely love the fact that I get to teach the future generation um, of medical practitioners. And my most favorite part of it is going to graduation um, at the end of the year in July and seeing 350 new UCL doctors going out into the working world. Um, and as I said at the beginning, I think the great thing about working in healthcare is the team working, is working with people who want to care for other people and look after other people. 
and appreciate what that is and how you can make a small difference to somebody's life. Um, I was a general practitioner before I came to um, UCL as a teacher um, and I loved the fact that I got to see people at the best of times as well as the worst of times um, and to try and make that small difference to them. Um, and so if you're thinking about a career in healthcare, think about it really carefully because there are so many different careers that you may well never have heard of. Mm. Um, and so don't feel that sort of medicine and nursing are the only things that you can do in healthcare. There are so many more things. Um, and so my piece of advice would be to, as Nikki said, talk to somebody in that profession um, and find out whether you would love to do that because you need the passion, as Nikki said, um, and that's me. Thank you, Sarah. Um, uh, Katie, over to you. Hi, I'm Katie. I'm here to talk about optometry. Um, an optometrist carries out an eye health assessment and an assessment of vision um, and prescribes glasses or contact lenses if needed. And we refer anything major to the hospital. I'm currently in my third year of the BSc course, uh, optometry course at City University of London. So optometry study at university for three years and do a period of assessed clinical training in a practice before you get fully registered. And this normally takes about 15 months. And this can either be in a high street chain or a hospital setting, whichever one you'd prefer. Um, you are paid for this, but your testing is checked by a supervisor and you have exams throughout. At City, um, we spend our first two years of the course developing skills by testing each other. And then in the third year, we spend lots of time at the university's designated opticians, where we test members of the public, students and university staff. I'm glad I've had this opportunity as now I feel prepared for the, like, the job at the end. There really is a variety to learn on the course. Um, for example, there's lots of biology, anatomy, optics, clinical skills, and you do a dissertation in your third year. You do need ABB at A-level, um, including two from biology, chemistry, maths or physics, and you can't do, BTECs are not accepted. My favourite part of optometry is working with the public, as I like to make a difference to people's quality of life, um, and it's very rewarding to see an improvement in someone's vision. Um, I'd, my one piece of advice would be to do work experience, because this is where I realised that optometry was the profession for me. Um, Obviously, with COVID, it's not as available. So I'd suggest like reading around the subject, have a look online, see what articles you can find. And if the opportunity for work experience does come up, do you take it? Even if it's the summer before uni, it's better to decide that if you don't want to do it then than halfway through your degree. So I hope that's given you a feel for what studying optometry is like and what the career entails. And good luck with your studies. Thank you, Katie. And I appreciate that, particularly around the, the kind of experience through COVID. That's really helpful. Um, Yatunde, could I move on to you next? Hello, everybody. Um, I welcome everybody watching us at home and uh, all the uh, panelists as well. Um, Midway Fit Lecturer at Middlesex University. I'll be teaching uh, for the last 10 years, but practicing as a registered midwife as over 18 years. I've enjoyed it and it is rewarding. And I can tell you it's one job that you go in every blessed day, you come out, you make the family happy and they come back and say, yes. You, it creates an atmosphere of joy and of laughter for the whole family. Even despite the COVID, we see a phone in, on the maternity world because new lives, new babies are being delivered on a daily basis. Uh, what can I tell you about midwifery? It is something that you will enjoy. It is a passion that you must have that passion to come to me with free. And it's something that is 24 hours as all the healthcare job is 24 hours, but it's something that you will always look back and enjoy it. I'm part of the research midwife that we do a better bat. And this is about continuity of care, continuity of case loading, which we've also introduced in our university as well. So I'm looking forward to meet everybody. And I'm think, and I like Sarah said, choose carefully the pathway you want to go because you want to choose any career for your for the future one one thing is that's going to be last longing and then you can go back and you can smile with your family without extra load on, on, upon yourself thank you so much thank you and they really appreciate that bernadine can i move on to you next please yeah hello everybody my name is bernadine and i'm in my third year of um, um a bsc speech and language therapy degree um, many of you may not have even considered studying for the role of a speech and language therapist because you didn't know it existed. Quite often people come to the, this sort of role because they've seen it in practice. They, they've either had speech and language 
speech and language therapy themselves or they know somebody that has and it's improved their lives. So let me tell you a little bit about what we do. Um, in short, we provide life improving treatment, support and care for children and adults who have difficulties with communication, eating, drinking or swallowing. We assess and treat speech and language communication problems in people of different ages to help them communicate better. And we do this by assessing, treating and developing personal care plans for them, working directly with the clients and their carers. So everybody is involved in, in all of the um, treatment, the whole step of the way. We also work closely with teachers and other, and other health professionals, such as doctors, nurses, other allied health professionals and psychologists to develop a holistic individual treatment plan. And we can also be found working in the criminal justice system. So to give you an idea of those that we support, it could be premature babies and infants with conditions including cerebral palsy, cleft palate and Down syndrome from very early in life, those who have difficulties with drinking, swallowing and play and communication skills. Supporting children with speech and language communication difficulties, including developmental language delay, autistic spectrum conditions, disfluency, which is another word for stammering or stuttering, and hearing problems. And this may be in hospitals, children's centres, mainstream nurseries, special schools, and the community clinics in, or in their own homes. So there's a um, quite a diverse um, area uh, that you could actually go to treat people. And then adults as well, adults with learning difficulties, those who have developmental conditions, such as learning disabilities, um, and supporting adults with communication um, as a result of a um, medical condition such as a stroke or head and neck cancer, Parkinson's disease and dementia, and of course, COVID-19. Um, you may even work in the criminal justice system. Um, at least 60% of people in the youth justice system have a speech and language communication needs. And um, we've done a lot of research in this area and uh, delivery of speech and language therapy in, in this uh, it's sort of institution has been shown to reduce offend reoffending rates by as much as 50%. So it's something that's a really a growing area that you probably never thought of. So as you can see, there's a variety of client groups and settings and services. It's really wide. You don't have to know where you want to specialise when you start your degree, as you'll cover everything over the three years. And you'll have a chance to try out many of the skills whilst you're on placements. Many of our students have, have started um, the course thinking that they wanted to work with children and then change their minds as the course has progressed. And now they want to work with adults. Um, we have diff different clinical placements every year, which sit within the professional studies model module and you will undertake weekly and block clinical placements under the supervision of actual speech and language therapists. Um, you'll also have a, a support by a number of staff and also of course you will receive a non-repayable non and non-means tested government grant of, of £5,000 per year. So if you enjoy working with people you think you might enjoy working part of a team have good communication skills, enjoy, enjoy solving problems, and want to be part of a dynamic, rapidly developing profession, which draws on elements of science, education, psychology, and medicine, then maybe you should take a closer look at studying for a speech and language therapy degree. And that's me. Thank you, Bernadine, thank you so much. Um, and Abigail, I, I'd, I'd love to hear from you as our final panelist. Hi everyone, my name is Abigail and I'm a final year adult nursing student at Middlesex University. So at Middlesex University, we have three fields of nursing. We have adult nursing, mental health nursing and child nursing. So when you apply, you would have to choose one field, but as you get in the university, you will be allowed to do various placements where you will know if you really want to do adult nursing or child or mental. So you are always allowed to switch at first year. But once you change your mind in first year, second year, the field that you choose to go, that is the field that you will finish as. So at Middlesex University, middle, um, nursing is split into 50% theory and 50% practicals, which is placement. So placement is where you get all your key nursing skills. And at Middlesex, there's loads of um, hospitals that we go to, such as Barnet Hospital, Chase Farm, North Mid, there's the loose. So you'll be, you'll be given one part and then that's where you'll be doing your placements. Also, you are, you are also, um, as a nurse, 
you are also you'll be working with loads of people as in members of the multidisciplinary team so you will get to basically see different healthcare professions whilst in placement if you think you've got like another idea or you want to get into another speciality you can also speak to people about it and see where you really want to go and train so you are you'll be trained for three years and after everything with your assessment and your placement you pass all your competencies you'll be given a pin from the nmc which is the national military free council and then you'll be practicing as a nurse thank you thanks abigail appreciate that um what one of the key questions and i think all of you have touched on it in some way but one of the key questions is about the the breadth of choice uh, of all these different roles can be quite overwhelming um you know and, and abigail you touched there on on uh, you know how when you turn start the course you know you've got a bit of flexibility at the beginning, but um, eventually you'll kind of have to narrow down and make some kind of choice. I wonder, and, and I'm going to address this to you initially, Nikki, but but perhaps other people would want to to weigh in. You know, how, how do you end up uh, making that choice, and is that quite linear? Is there only one point where you can kind of um, make that that choice to change into something you want? Mm. For me, when I interview students, what I'm really looking for is somebody who knows about mental health and who cares about it. You know, so if somebody were to turn up and say, I want to be a nurse, but I'm not sure what kind, we probably wouldn't take them for mental health mm. because it's a really specific skill set. You have to have a real passion for it. You have to have an interest in it. Um, I think if you like people, if you feel that um, everyone should be treated fairly if you have a real interest You're not too hung up on things being a bit strange sometimes that's not a problem for you <laughs> we're probably your your best bet <laughs> but I think um, mental health goes across all the fields now so I don't think there's a single person who deals with people that doesn't address this in some way so if you have two twin passions if you if you really are interested in in medicine or midwifery or optometry or any of those things you know, there's no reason why you can't be specialist because that's an, a specialist practitioner because that's another thing that happens quite a lot is that all of the fields will have crossover areas. Yeah. So I think find something that you care about that aligns with your values and who you are as a person and how you want to live and, and express yourself. You know, if you're a really quiet person, you can still be any of these. It might be that you, were, you go into that and research. If you're somebody who, you know, loves a lot of kind of chatting, maybe you'll go into the field that you love and education or and publication or all those sorts of things. So one of the things that's fantastic about healthcare roles generally is you can often do them very flexibly. So part time, you can do a lot of bank work, things like that, which allows you to do more than one thing at once or maybe juggle family or caring commitments, things like that. But it also allows you to um, build up an, a, a kind of portfolio. So I started as a nurse when I didn't even know I wanted to be a mental health nurse. <laughs> I was kind of co-opted into it by other people telling me, oh, you are. <laughs> and then I realized, yes, I am. Um, and then I went to study. Um, I traveled in Australia. I worked in Australia when I was traveling around uh, through the through sort of Bangkok area and places like that. And that was a fantastic journey for me. Then I came back to work in London. Um, I went down to work on the South Coast in Brighton and I started running women's services there. So that was when I first had my own personal interest in mm. what I was able to do and built up my specialty there. Then um, I started being more passionate about it and I wanted to tell everybody. So then I went into practice education, which is another type of, of nursing. And all the areas have educators linked in practice to what they're doing. And then you can also go into university if that's something of interest to you as well. So when you're choosing to be a nurse, a midwife, a doctor, an optometrist, a radiotherapist you there are lots of different options still within those different fields so don't feel that you're being hemmed in early what we're saying generally is find out the sort of area you love and then head into it and I think some people are asking about you know about work experience and I think everyone will have stuff to say about this mm -hmm. but work experience is really important you don't need to have specific nursing, uh, nursing experience or medical experience to go into these sorts of roles what you need to show is that you like people we really cannot be doing in healthcare with people who don't like other people. <laughs> you, you know, you don't have to be like incredibly chatty, but you do have to have a compassion and care and interest for other people. You don't have to be loud, but you, it has to be something that motivates you. And if other people do your head in, <laughs> this isn't for you. You know, there's loads of jobs that will, will allow you to do stuff. So I think anything you're working with the public, any team working, any, anything from bar work, catering, shop work, volunteering, anything that shows that you are flexible and can connect to other people will start to tell you what kind of person you are and what kind of working life you like. And from then on, you can sort of narrow it down. So for me, as soon as I met mental health nursing and understood what it was, that was it. 
So I'm, I'm probably not a good example of how to narrow it down because I was like that one. <laughs> no, I think, I think perhaps we should come to somebody else on that. <laughs> no, I think that's really really helpful. Um, and actually, also maybe offered a transition to something I was going to ask uh, Sarah around because you you kind of talked about experience being one of the things that can can help give you an idea of what you want to do and. And, and Sarah, for those students out there, you know, trying to, uh, you know, apply for a course, perhaps in, in medicine, um, you know, what, what advice would you would you be able to offer them? What else do you look for? Absolutely. So um, medicine is a long degree. It's five or six years. So it is longer than other degree courses at university. Um, and so you've got to be prepared for that uh, when you think about it. Um, and it does tend to have quite high entry requirements as well. So uh, most universities require three A's at A level. Um, we actually require an A star and two A's at UCL. Um, um, so do look at the entry requirements for each of these courses and see whether you feel like you're on track for that. The entry requirements are there for us to make sure that you're going to thrive and survive on our course because that's what we want. When we're choosing candidates to, to come on our programme, what I want to see is them at the end of the course becoming a doctor. Um, and it's the worst thing for us is for people to come on the course and then struggle and, and then have to drop out. So, so do think about whether you meet those requirements. Um, in terms of work experience, so this is a, com a question I've been asked very commonly over the last 12 months. And as Nikki said, Work experience doesn't have to be alongside a doctor um, or a nurse or in the clinical environment because that's actually quite difficult to get. So please don't assume that that's the only thing that you can do. Um, I would recommend that you um, have a look at NHS values because that actually fits across all NHS um, health and social care professionals um, and what those are. And then how can you demonstrate those? And do you demonstrate those? Do you enjoy those sorts of things? So Nikki mentioned care and compassion. They are a big part of this. Communication skills, team working, leadership skills, um, but showing that you are academically curious, that you want to come to university and to, to open your mind and explore other areas, and that you're motivated to work with and care for other people. Um, in terms of specific medical work experience, so during the pandemic, we've actually produced a lot more virtual work experience for students. So um, Brighton and Sussex Medical School have put together a fantastic um, virtual work experience module. The Royal College of General Practitioners have observed GP um, where they've got videos of consultations for you to reflect upon and to think about what skills are being demonstrated and can you potentially see yourself in that situation in the future. Mm. Um, we also recommend that you read blogs by doctors, yeah. look online, um, even you know, sometimes watch TV programmes. Some of those reality TV programmes about medicine and healthcare can be really helpful in, in knowing what it is like to work in those environments without actually having to be in the environment itself. Um, but just try and think about what skills you're developing and what you're learning about yourself, because when it comes to the application process, what we want to see is how you've reflected on those experiences and how you think you fit into um, that degree course and what motivates you to do it and what preparation have you made for mm. coming to university. Amazing. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. And what, one of the things you, you kind of talked to, talked about, it, I think everyone here has actually, um, is just pathways into the healthcare sector are different for everyone. Um, and I, th I think one of the things that, that some of the students have, have kind of put in their questions is around, you know, the different qualifications they're studying, some that might not fit with the, the kind of medical route you talked about, Sarah. Um, but, but, you know, the all of the students here in this in this session and the, the, the panelists students have chosen to do a, a university course. So I thought I might touch base um, with, with, with them and, and just find out really, really briefly what, what made them choose to, to do a university course. Why did they choose that university was their pathway into, into healthcare? Perhaps uh, Bernadine, you could you could begin and then, then I can move on. 
Um, at the time, I think it's changed now, um, it was only through going to university and getting a speech and language therapy degree that you could actually get into speech and language therapy. I do believe, I think it's now being developed, the time, all the time I've been studying, I've been doing it three years, that there now is um, an apprenticeship. Um, but if you check out um, the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapy um, website, they should have all the details on there. But it is a good way to do it because you can sort of learn on the job. Um, I don't, obviously I don't know much about it because I haven't done it and I think it's only just come to fruition but it's definitely something I would have looked at at the time had it been available. Perfect, thank you. And perhaps Katie, if in terms of your, your choice with, in terms of studying, um, you know, maybe, maybe you could tell us a bit more about some of the things you really enjoy about your course specifically as a university course. Yeah, so for me, I, optometry, like I always wanted to do optometry, so university had to be an option for me because it's the only way, like Bernadine said, you can get into like these kind of professions. Um, but for me, I like the practical element of the course. So I don't really think I'd be one of the people who'd be able to sit in lectures all the time. Um, quite like that there's like half practical, half lectures. Um, and obviously that putting into practice what you've learned in the lectures in the practicals, I think is a good way to like consolidate your knowledge really. Brilliant. And, and Abigail, anything you wanted to add in around why you, you made the choice for to go for a, a university course? Um, I think for nursing, there is an apprenticeship route. But however, if you are not already in a hospital, as in a trust you are working for, it's very hard to get into in an apprenticeship way. So it's always safe to like go to university but if you're already working in a hospital they can help you to get into university and do it as a nursing associate course as well but i will also advise that it is always so important if you want to do any health course that when you go placement take advantage of it because that is where you learn all your skills that you will need to practice so it's very important to take notes from placement thank you abigail um, Yutunde, I wonder if I could hear from you next. So uh, one of the things that has come up continuously is students worried about their grades. And that may be because of, you know, the exams being very different this, this year or, or, or any number of reasons. Um, I just wondered if you had any advice to, to someone who's worried about their grades about making that application this year or who might be considering delaying a year, um, if you had any advice in that area. I think uh, in terms of assessment, I think in most, uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, Middlesex University, what we do in mm. terms of assessment. Um, most of our assessment, uh, we do coursework in the first year for our students, mostly is a coursework and then they do have a practical exam in the first year and it's very elementary and i always said elementary and just basic knowledge in maths which we because part of midwifery journey is about drug and calculation and that will be the something that you will do throughout your whole career so you can do it so a knowledge on your numeracy is very important that you understand how to do your numeracy and also the knowledge around your biology, your human biology, particularly for those students who are coming into midwifery, your human biology is very important and that will make you to excel in your first year, particularly when it comes to your OSCEs, which is your normal oral examination. This is going to be an oral examination, uh, which is often recorded in the clinical skills lab. So we'll be, we'll be tested on that. In your second year, it is more of a written and examination or the exam condition. Some of the examination is online and we've started that and we've seen that has worked despite the COVID and it has to work now. So I think we're going to go to, to that pathway. We're not changing everything, even the despite COVID. There are some things that we learn from COVID that we have to stick with it and then we have to continue rolling it like that. And, and, and your third year is also an um, oral examination, but also at the same time, you have to do your writing of, of your project or your dissertation or doing a research of what you really want to uh, disseminate across of the knowledge you've gained for the last three years. The assessment wise, I would say is this time about time management. 
moment you start in the university, you need to begin to think about how do you want to manage your time. Mm -hmm. It's all about time management. It's not the time that you just leave open the book and just close it onto the last minute when the lecturer tells you exam is next week and you're thinking, oh, okay, where is my book now? Let me go and start studying. It is, it is a very wrong approach. As uh, Katie mentioned earlier on, most of our nursing doctors, uh, mental health, uh, career uh, and so on approach and therefore you need most of the time when you learn something in the clinical placement you need to go back home to do more findings more knowledge around it otherwise if you're learning in the placement and you're not coming back home to look at to find more research about that particular topic mm -hmm. you then be, re realize that you become vague and you're not giving enough knowledge about what you've learned in practice and most of the time, everything you've learned both in the university and practice are all aligned together. So you need to bring them together to make more succinct knowledge in what you've learned. And I would say, please, 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 if you're coming to university, it's a good way to learn, good way to meet with other people, but you're most, you must be ready to sit tight and manage your time wisely. Thank you, Yatinda. And I think particularly as some of our students here are in year 10, that understanding that that critical core skill it's not health related it's just a, a life skill um you know is something so important across all of these uh sectors and um, i wanted to also touch on something you, you'd mentioned around um you know changes due to covid uh, and of course that's happened across the board not just in healthcare um i, I wondered i first of all I'm, i mean i'm gonna i'm gonna pass to to you nikki and ask you if there's been any particular changes in your in your course and, and how that is taught but you know you might have a, a quick mention about uh, anything within the mental health um, sphere as well um, yeah okay thank you very much um yeah we have seen a lot of changes like everybody has um a couple of things just to, to bear in mind is there's a difference between um mental health issues or mental illness sometimes people call it and well-being issues mm. and i think sometimes people are getting those muddled up because they're everywhere right now and i appreciate it. it looks like we're a massive growth industry unfortunately at the moment but it's something just to bear in mind that there's a whole spectrum of mental health care which some of that can be kind of statutory care in the nhs where people might need to see specialist um nurses doctors ot's um, uh, it might be able to see people in the community, but also there's a lot being done now in schools, uh, all sorts of education facilities, um, GP surgeries in the community, just to make sure that people are, are uh, experiencing the best life that they can, kind of we're talking more general well-being there. Yeah. So it might be that you might perhaps more interested in psychology or counselling or something like that. So it's a big spectrum of, of health. And this goes for all of all of the different health areas. You can have everything right from, you know, sort of almost brief encounters with, with, with health right through to actually needing or being able to work in, um, in perhaps hospitals or even prisons, things like that, or all have um, space for health professionals. So not only can you choose from, I appreciate, I'm maybe not helping you narrow down your choices here, but not only are you choosing between the fields, you're choosing about what kind of intensity of working you might want to do as well. So it might be that you want to be a school nurse. It might be that you want to be a prison or work in a prison centre. It might be that you know you really have a passion for that and you're really interested in it. It might be that you want to work with children or adolescents or older adults. So you've got all these different options to consider when you're thinking about what, what it is that you want to do. Um, and you don't need to decide right now. Just put yourself in the place where you're able to start start the journey. You don't have to see the end point right now. So I think keep it as broad as possible in terms of getting people skills, finding out what you might want to study and what want to look at, and then starting to move that way. So keep your options open because often there are jobs that you will come across and you're like, I had no idea that was a thing. I love it. That's definitely me. <laughs> I think the development of people skills is something that has been a common thread uh, across everyone here um, today, actually. Um, Sarah, I just wonder if I could address you around the, the impact of, of COVID, perhaps on admissions or teaching. Or, uh... Totally forgotten that was the question. No, guys. no, 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 so no, no. Sorry. But you brought up some really important bits as well. So I think oh, that's... yeah, COVID, I remember. Um, basically, our theory modules are online at the moment. We're teaching online. But in practice, obviously, it, we don't stop. No health service stops just because things are tough. We just carry on. Yeah, so okay. um, if you're if you're a person who wants to stop, maybe that's another thing to bear in mind. <laughs> Thanks, Nikki. Sarah, over to you. Sure. Um, so yeah. So uh, in terms of COVID, we 
we had to pivot very quickly, like everybody else, last March uh, to a lot of online learning. So last March, actually, all of our clinical placements stopped um, for a good six months um, because obviously the NHS was incredibly stretched at that point and they wanted to reduce the footfall across hospital sites. So online learning happened for a lot of our students, uh, which was very interesting doing clinical skills. We actually uh, were, were doing practical procedures on fruits and vegetables and um, uh, doing basic life support on teddy bears. It was great. Um, but, but now we've, um, we've moved back to um, all of our students, all of our clinical students, which are the students in the hospitals and community placements in the final three years of the programme, are all in the clinical environment, have been very much helping out with the, the COVID effort. They've been on the intensive care unit. They've been volunteering their time. They've been absolutely amazing, actually. I'm, I'm thoroughly proud of our medical students and how they have contributed um, to the effort. Early years has been a bit different. Um, so early years of our courses is quite theory based. So it is uh, online lectures. Um, there are some online practical tasks and modules that we have, and it's been a mixture of, of what we're calling synchronous and asynchronous teaching. So some recorded activity, some live activity to come to. We've just restarted some practical based teaching again, um, as we were allowed to from the 8th of March to get some of our early year students back into the clinical skills laboratory and um, to do some of those practical procedures like examining patients and making up injections um, and carrying out basic life support. Um, so it's been quite a change. Um, but I think everybody's responded quite admirably to the situation. And no matter what happens, you will get a really good education coming to university because you're going to be taught by so many different people from so many different backgrounds. And I think one of the things that I loved about coming to university and coming to university in London as well in such a, a metropolitan city was just meeting all of those new people. Mm. And not just from, from my course, but from vast other courses as well um, and and it was it was amazing to just just get to know so many different people from so many different backgrounds um, the one thing I also wanted to mention was about the different routes in that came up before um, because please don't think that you have to make a decision when you're 16 17 to go to university when you're 18 um, there are an awful lot of people out there who don't quite know what they want to do when they leave school um, and may take up a completely different degree as Nikki was alluding to. Um, and so we have lots of students um, who've gone off and done other things and then decided that actually medicine's for me. So I've, I've had people who've gone into other healthcare professions. So gone into nursing, gone into midwifery, gone into radiography, um, and who have then decided to, to become doctors and have applied as graduates. Um, but also people who've done other degrees of humanities degrees, have had languages students, law students, who just realize that actually something in healthcare is what I really want to do when they get a bit older. And that's absolutely okay. Um, in medicine, we have graduate entry courses that are a bit shorter that are four years rather than the five years or six years and um, that you can specifically apply to. Um, and so the doors never closed. That's the, the thing is that if you want to do one of these um, different professions, then you can, if you have the passion for it, do it, um, but do it whenever that passion comes to you. Amazing, thank you. And passion has definitely rung through across everyone here. Um, we, we're coming up to the last minute or two, and I, I would just like to, uh, I, we're going to send around a poll shortly to ask everyone how they found this experience. Thank you, Jane. Uh, while while you're, you're filling that, that out, um, I do have a couple of shorter questions that I wanted to throw out uh, briefly. I think first one to you, Tunde, um, and this is one of the questions from Jessica saying, I, I'm a C, C I'm going to pronounce this correct, incorrectly, so please forgive me. A C-hash, uh, level three health and social he social care student and want to become a midwife but don't have five GCSEs. I've only got English and maths GCSEs. Does, does that mean it's still accessible 
Um, to, to be um, the mass and GCSE is one of the mandatory that you must have if you're going to do particularly uh, midwifery or any of the nursing course. It is one of the mandatory requirements for GCSE for you to have um, mass and English at uh, C credits. That, that is the minimum what is the government and UCAS requirements for everybody is asking for. And I would say then, if you don't have that, go and do an access to nursing or access to midwifery, uh, you'll be able to have those credit that you need in terms of you to have that. And then obviously they can, you able to sit for your English and maths for you to get your C uh, level C credits for you to come and do your midwifery. Uh, but you, there's other colleges that, that can give you the access to sit for your GCSE to have your level C. Thank you, Atunde. Um, there is option as well. Thank you. I can see a couple of uh, panelists have already been answering questions in the Q&A. Uh, thank you so much for that. Um, we, we will leave, leave this open for a minute or two, um, but I did want to make sure just in the time limit that I say a huge thank you to everyone uh, in, on the panel for, for, for sharing their time with us. Uh, we've had uh, nearly 50 students kind of tune in to this and hopefully this has been a really, really useful uh, opportunity to hear around a huge breadth of different courses uh, and how uh, university is is a really powerful pathway to lots of different uh, roles but as I think has been re repeated a couple of times it's not the only pathway um, you know and, and there is, there's loads of opportunity to get into healthcare. Um, amazing. Uh, Jake I, I think we'll um, we'll kind of wrap up there is there anything you wanted to add before before we did so? No, just to say thank you to everyone and uh, um, yeah, everyone who's still in this session has polled um, and the feedback's excellent. So thank you all so much. Thank you very much, panellists. Thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you everyone who's attended as well. Really appreciate it. All recordings will be shared with you by email um, and you can watch it on YouTube later. Have a good evening, everyone.